All right. Now I want to start looking into more mechanisms for the sintering process, specifically uh, how mass is transported uh, during the processes you've sort of seen a little bit so far. So um, again, before we sort of start on this, I want you to uh, see if you can come up with some various mass transport mechanisms that would move uh, atoms or ions to the necked region um, that you saw in the previous slides during sintering. So see if you can come up with some of those. Um, pause the video, come back when you've got uh, some, some ideas. All right, so here's a, a list that I came up with for some um, various mass transport mechanisms for sintering that we're going to look at uh, throughout this process. So surface diffusion. So this means atoms um, on the surface of a particle um, move along the surface uh, to the necked region here. Um, we can have volume diffusion. So that's when uh, atoms or uh, molecules from the interior or the volume of the particle uh, are transported uh, to this necked region. Um, there can be evaporation condensation. So we have uh, formation of a vapor and then those vapor molecules are redeposited or condensated um, on that region. Um, we can have grain boundary diffusion. So when um, uh, atoms or ions move along the grain boundaries um, in this uh, material. And we can also have plastic flow. So this is when we actually have dislocation motion and we have uh, motion um, as the material plastically deforms and changes shape. We can have uh, those particles moving there. So this is just kind of showing an edge dislocation here um, that can move. And so we're gonna talk in uh, about each of these in, in various ways and what this means for the sintering process. And so to start out, um, I wanna sort of draw your attention to two different scenarios that can happen during um, sintering. So during that process of heating it up and allowing uh, atoms or ions to diffuse. And so those are densification. So like I said, for the most part, this is what we're after. We want to eliminate empty space. Uh, we want to densify, increase the density of a material. And then the other option is coarsening. So this is where uh, we have uh, the particles uh, growing, but we don't necessarily have densification. So we're not eliminating the empty space. So here's just kind of a simple illustration showing uh, particles uh, here with a lot of empty space and they densify. So you see the elimination um, of empty space. Whereas here we see the same starting point, but uh, the ending point here is that the particles got bigger, but we still have all this empty space. These are just kind of illustrations, but this kind of shows you the two extremes uh, of what we're after and what we can get for this. And so basically the idea is we're trying to reduce surface energy. And so in both of these cases, that's the idea. So if we densify, we form grain boundaries and um, we uh, grow to larger size grains and that can uh, reduce surface energy because we no longer have a surface, we have a grain boundary. Uh, in the other case here, coarsening, we're um, not eliminating surfaces, but we're reducing the surface energy by making larger and larger particles. And so the, that's two routes. We can uh, reduce the excess of surface energy, um, but there's two routes. One of them we tend to think uh, is superior to the other. Okay, so let's sort of look at uh, a couple paths that we can take uh, to sort of achieving this max, uh, maximum density by densifying uh, in grain growth. And so we're going to see a few of these throughout this section and centering, but you'll see this quite a bit because it can tell us a lot of information. Uh, we're going to frequently plot grain size on the y-axis and percent theoretical density, so basically density on the x-axis. So here 100, that's the theoretical maximum uh, that you saw. So again, this should uh, seem familiar to the, the lab. Um, I ask 
for something in terms of percent theoretical density um, because this is a common way of plotting. Um, so basically, uh, this is our maximum possible density that we can achieve for this material, and then down here is zero, and then we're looking at uh, small grain size to large grain size. And uh, we're looking at different paths here. So for X, uh, this is basically an illustration of coarsening. So if we just increase grain size and we don't really change density that much, uh, then this is the example of coarsening that we saw in the previous slide. So basically, um, uh, this is kind of what we have um, uh, small grains, uh, small particles and they go to larger particles without much change in density. So there's still lots of empty space uh, in this path X. Um, the other extreme is where we have kind of the maximum possible densification. And this is where, if you sort of look at this trajectory, where we don't have much of a growth in the grain size. So basically, instead of going straight up, we're almost going horizontal. So what that tells us is we're getting densification before we have grain growth. And the grain growth only um, comes in later, uh, much later uh, to the trajectory. So basically, in this case, uh, those particles are coming together, forming grain, uh, grain boundaries, um, eliminating the porosity before we have noticeable grain growth. And so really only at the very end do our particles get very large. And so that's 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 um, that's what's um, uh, the important part here is that uh, we have densification followed by grain growth. Uh, and then obviously we can have uh, something in the sort of middle here where um, we have densification, but the grain size is increasing as well. And so we don't tend to have the maximum possible density unless grain growth is suppressed until after densification occurs. And so that's a major part of the ceramic centering um, community is how can we suppress grain growth so that we can densify before that happens. And so oftentimes that's called coarsening uh, as well. So we wanna try to suppress coarsening. And so one of the options is we can oftentimes add things to a material that would cause that suppression. And so for alumina, Al2O3, um, if we dope it with MgO, it's been found that we can increase the density. So essentially um, the undoped is the black curve here. So we see that it follows pretty close to the, um, the, uh, the maximum that we saw before. But if we add in a very small amount of MgO, so only 250 parts per million, then we see that it kind of suppresses the grain size. So the grain size is, is lessened and that allows us to get a higher uh, possible density. So you can see that we're almost at 100% when we add that in here. So just adding that material suppressed the grain growth and allowed us to densify uh, therefore first. And so this is, a, like I said, a big part of ceramics is can we suppress grain growth, uh, therefore uh, allowing densification to happen prior to the grain growth. And that's a big part of this process. Okay, so uh, if we look at sort of particles at the small scale during centering, um, there's got to be a driving force for this process to occur. And one of those is the, uh, one of those driving forces locally is curvature differences. And this can be um, useful for small particles and also pores. And so if we look at um, sort of three hypothetical situations, uh, one um, case where the surface is what we would call concave, uh, one where the surface is flat, and then the other where the surface is convexed. So if we, <coughs> excuse me, if we think about these in our simple sort of thought experiment where each of these um, grains is in isolation, we put it in a vacuum, and then we look at the pressure uh, when we equalize it at a high temperature. So we're basically looking at the partial pressure um, of each of these surfaces, what we see is that the pressure of this first one, the concave 
um, situation is actually the lowest. So P1 is the lowest because the atoms on that surface are the most strongly bonded. So if I think about a particle, uh, the, the darkened particle here, it's coordinated very heavily um, with the rest of the material. So on a concave structure, the particles are very strongly bonded due to the, co the high coordination, and therefore the pressure, the amount of uh, atoms that goes uh, to the vapor is low. And that then decreases slightly when we have a flat surface, and then decreases even more when we go to a concave surface. So if you think about this uh, particle here at the top or this one, it's not as coordinated as the other two scenarios. And so the pressure and the amount of particles that go to the vapor phase is the highest. And so how that translates to uh, centering is that these con convex, sorry, so convex shapes uh, tend to um, uh, be eliminated because these particles will go to the other phase to try to eliminate this convex shape. And the same thing, uh, so the reverse is true here. More atoms will tend to uh, form into, um, or add into this type of particle with a concave shape. Uh, and then flat tends to be kind of in the middle where it tends to actually be at a, a sort of local equilibrium because of the curvature. So there's not much driving force associated with this middle uh, scenario. And so how that results is that the convex tend to model very small particles well. And so small particles tend to uh, grow, either grow or be uh, consumed by other grains to sort of get to this um, larger, um, larger case in, in, in here. And so how this sort of translates uh, to, to what we see is that um, um, if we look at various grains and we look at the number of grain boundaries that it has in 2D, uh, we see that this scenario here where we have six uh, grain boundaries uh, and you see that these are kind of flattened uh, regions, this is at what we would term uh, a metastable equilibrium because these curvatures are flat. Whereas the smaller grains um, here, which only, <coughs> excuse me, which tend to be coordinated by less grain boundaries, tend to be uh, convex. And so they are not, they tend to uh, want to, um, those atoms in this shape tend to want to go to the other uh, grains. Um, and same thing with uh, the spore, but the larger one, so it's larger than six, um, this is uh, representative of a very large grain uh, and so these tend to um, consume atoms and ions from the other neighboring convex. So this is concave, and so they tend to uh, add in shapes. And so in general, these uh, if I should kind of show this schematic here, then these small particles tend to be consumed by neighboring larger particles. And so the, the six ones here are kind of stable, but this one tends to disappear and be consumed by the atoms around it in other grains. And then the same thing here, this is very stable, but it tends to grow at the expense of those smaller particles that are coordinated with less grain boundaries because of this kind of curvature um, effect. Okay, so kind of let's get back to this coarsening versus densification. What we see is that whether we coarsen or densify, it really depends on the mechanism of mass transport. So if we have surface diffusion, where we saw the particles from the surface are simply uh, moved to the neck region, or if we have evaporation condensation, where it goes into the vapor phase and then deposits on the neck region, <coughs> excuse me, either one of those mechanisms, that tends to result in coarsening or no shrinkage. Because what happens is that we have mass transport movement right? So clearly things are moving from one uh, place to another, but they're not doing it in such a way that these particles are going to move closer together. So when we think about this in a model system, if we model this as two circles or spheres, uh, 
What we want to see for densification is the fact that their centers of mass, so the center of this sphere and this sphere, get closer and closer together. Well, since the atoms are not uh, coming from within the 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 spheres, they're just uh, they're basically just rearranging on the surface, and so that doesn't cause things to move closer and closer together. So this just is coarsening. So if we have those type of mechanisms, that's going to give us coarsening. Um, however, if the atoms are from between the particles, right? So again, center of mass here and here. If the particles come from this region in between those centers of mass and then move to the, the neck, what that does is it moves the center masses closer and closer together. And so that, it, on a simple case, this is shrinkage. So these particles are shrinking together. And on the global scale, this means that we have densification. So we're um, densifying the material. And so any of those mechanisms that we talked about where the mass is coming from the centers, uh, between the centers of mass, we're going to get um, densification. And so we want to obviously try to um, favor those mechanisms if we're trying to densify. And if we aren't trying to densify, if we're trying to just form larger and larger particles, then we can use surface or evaporation condensation. And so that's basically what this shows as well. So this is just another illustration showing if we're looking at surface or vapor transport, uh, we're moving mass, but it's not moving these spheres closer and closer together. It can still eliminate uh, this kind of some of this empty space in between, but it's not good uh, overall if we're trying to, to densify. Whereas if we now look at the case where diffusion occurs between the centers, we see, so this is before when they're just in contact. If now they start to uh, form a neck formation because of diffusion, and then that material from within goes to the neck region out here, that pulls mass from between these centers of masses, and so they get closer and closer together. So it's, it's a little subtle, but you can see that these uh, particles are getting closer and closer together.